Good morning, good day, good evening. Hope you're very good where you sit, feeling well. Today is going to be good. We've got a good discussion on genetics, plant breeding, plant testing, and it's going to be exciting. I put this off for about six months, this talk, so there's, um, there's quite a lot to get through. Uh, where should we start? I put this off for about six months. Um, well, first as a disclaimer, this channel is a legal channel and it only promotes legal activities. It respects the law and I hope you respect the law too. And, oh yeah, this will be good. There's today's stuff. So we're going to go through plant genetics, some breeding, some plant handling techniques, some testing and the HY5 gene, or it's the elongated hypocotyl, so it stretches the plant. The, diff the opposite of that would be the DWF gene, which is the dwarfing gene, so I would keep it short. So it's pretty cool. But, um, and some other information from about six months ago, because this is when I made this up. It's not all right. Now back to it. Which one? Confusing for some reason. There we go. Now you can hear me. Yep. And the questions, if you could put the questions with a question mark, please, and then um, I can see them a lot more easily as I go through. All right. Successfully. Yep. All right. I'm just trying to start here and share screen, get some other stuff up to show you. There's so much to go through. This is going to be a long, probably at least an hour and a half, I reckon. No one to say good day to yet. It's like folk coming in. I wonder if I should wait a bit. No, I'm not going to wait. We're getting into it. So here we go. We're sharing the screen. This is what I got to go through. Oh, no. That other folder's gone. Well, I'll just show you anyway. All of this stuff's got to go through today. So there's a heaps and there's a few good studies. There's a few good um, papers that I want to go through as well. Uh, I'll just rip into it. So this is reasons to legalise cannabis. First, I'm going to go through a little bit of like the news and reviews, which is what I used to do a few months ago. I'm getting back into a rhythm where I'm going to get all the latest um up to date the news and things like that and then what's happening in cannabis science and then what's some other papers that the latest papers have been happening and then i'll get into talking about genetics and breeding and showing all those different techniques and things and how to get the required gene transfers and your progeny and all that sort of stuff uh, i'll just stop sharing for a sec yeah good ned kelly thank you somebody's rocked up at least i know that it's working successfully <laughs> thanks mate all right rock back into it present so plant breeding so i'll go through the news and stuff first which is the legalized bit i think there's one already open so these are reasons why legalized cannabis has been the death since 2000, the year 2000. This is all death related in the world. So from chemotherapy, there's 22 million. From psychiatric drugs, there's been 11 million. Uh, other types of deaths, uh, letrogenic deaths, there's been 18 million. Bed sores, there's been 2 million people. And then cannabis down the bottom, none. No one's died from cannabis. Oh, and this is... Um, ages ago, six months ago, but it's Colombia. They're getting up in there and they're going to legalise it. They're actually only a few days away from, uh, from it going legal in Colombia as well. Congratulations. Uh, this is funny. Oh, it's an Irish, it's related to Ireland. It's their, um, it says, kiss me, I'm Irish. <laughs> it's related to the, the bill in parliament for legal cannabis got, uh, got drawn up and drafted. So it's a good positive step for Ireland too. And Biden signs it when you already know about that. 
This is a funny and a truth one. Now, look, this says, if your weed don't look like this, I'm going to have to remain slightly sceptical of your 49% THC lab result. And it's just a um, something to, it's a funny thing just to say that if it's uh, just this day and age, how the labs are just really psyching things up and giving false results. And yeah, so I just laughed. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, this says top secret facility is about to be uh, in, released in Australia. It's in Margaret River. So they're keeping it secret, good on them. It was on Channel 9 News, so it's not too secret. This is a nice little statement. If we need science to legalise cannabis, can we please see the science that was used to make it illegal in the first place? Hmm. And I like this one, Mother Nature wins. That's cool. I'll take that. That's today's. Uh, Mark resisted breathing. That would be up further. A rough guide in spotting bad science. I don't really want to go through that, actually, because we're going to have a lot more discussions on breeding and stuff. More breeding. This will happen if you have good genetics. So you can put exactly the same thing into your substrate and get the environment exactly the same, and you can get this outcome, or you can get something that's a lot smaller with bad genetics. So genetics make a massive, massive, they're just everything, to be honest. Uh, oh, difference, the different cultivars of cannabis. Sativa, indica, hybrid, and it should be ruderalis. They left one out. But because uh, it's the breeding, most things that come out in hybrid these days, because the hybrids are the mixed. So these are the, yeah, they just end up mixed. I'm not going to go on about that because there's way more better breeding stuff to do. What's this? Uh, oh, that's molecular. Hand drying. Oh, this is post-harvest technique. So to do with plant handling, that section, this is what you want it to well, kind of actually see in here. You can probably already spot the difference. Look at that, how much air can get through. So there's kind of chunky buds. So unless this humidity in here is down to 40%, the outside ones are going to dry way too faster than ones inside. So just an example of hang drying that's, yeah, I hang dry, but look how thick it is. There's too much product there. Um, what's this to do? Plant density. This is a cool study done on, actually I should come back to it. This is a bit more hang drying link. Oh, this is post harvest techniques. Another, you can probably already see what is wrong with this person's transporting. Uh, yeah, I just laughed at it to be honest because there's just nothing right about it. Oh. <laughs> For the start, they're not respecting the law as well, but yeah, it's just pretty funny. Here's some better hang drying, some examples of ones you, that are good. So see how there's air gaps in between them? And they're big. That's some big flower too. So they left enough air gaps between them where even up here could be questionable in the centre. So it might dry a little bit. Um, if they they'll have humidity gauges, but they won't be in centre where it's touching, where no air can get into. And that's going to cause fungal uh, germinations because there'll be fungal spores everywhere. And it's, people wonder, oh, why is it gone bad? Well, look, it's the drying that's let them down in this instance. Heterosis. All right, now I don't know where to start, really. Um, let's see what else is in here, because I can't really remember. Human chromosomes. Oh, yeah, this is the support thing. So five bucks for support, that little button underneath. Thank you for the subscription. $80 is for my private lectures. There's quite a few in there. There's a dozen or so uh, courses and folders that I put in that I don't include because my lectures, are, I save them in my playlists under my YouTube. So there's thousands there for you to go through for free. $150 for a subscription, we'll get a 20 minute video call and a novelty gift like a chart or something. Uh, $300 is like a weekly call 
uh, for more so a medical patient having problems or a, a company starting up, and they might want my opinion on different types of things. Some cannabis jobs. Here's some cool cannabis jobs this week. So if you're an artist, you can do, so you don't just need a degree, you don't need heaps of experience. You can use your love of passion of the plant and the medical properties that you've gotten out of it to create jobs for yourself. So it's entrepreneurship. So that's some art. Uh, embrace cannabis tourism, this one was, okay. <laughs> Very good. So where it's, in other words, where it's legal, where you are, you can somehow get tourism happening. Uh, this one says, um, it's global CBD skincare market was worth an estimated of nearly $1 billion. The CBD market, and CBD is legal in Australia as well. Uh, sorry, the CBD oil, or you can get it over the counter, that type of thing. Actually, I think plants are even legal as long as it's under 0.3% THC. Check with your law. This is nice. Look at this, the interior designer. So a nice big can of leaf up the back. So if you're into that type of thing, it's another interior design. Oh, keeping the pattern. Because uh, it's on breeding today, this is some the characteristics of the land races. People like land race cultivars because they're very homozygotic, meaning they're very stable in their uh, genetic line. So the chances of them herming out or having stress problems are low. So that's why people like them a lot. And there's, there's about, there's quite a few here. So I can't really, I'm gonna go through them, all the different types of particulars of them all. There's ones from Colombia, Hindu Kush, India, Jamaica, Lebanon, Malawi, Mexico, Morocco, Nepal, and Thailand. So they all have different characteristics about their land races. And because this genetics these days has been crossed so much with all of these, that's been crossed with this, and they cross that 100 times, and they don't strengthen it or they don't back crop, inbreed it to make it homozygotic or stable. There's just so much problem and stresses going on in plants these days. This is called a mutation. This is a root mutation. Very cool. Putting out three radicals. <laughs> so that plant is going to have a higher success rate. Here's another mutation. This is a chromophile mutation. Chlorophyll, sorry. Chromo. Chloro is the pigment. So that happens when mutants, they got... Well, the plant's got what? The cannabis plant's got 30, 32,000 genes in it, pairs of genes. So each one of those is going to go and open up a different signaling pathway. So here has had mutant genetics in its trichome pathway, and it's going to produce chlorophyll instead of producing oils and waxes and things that it usually stores in. So that's very nice, isn't it? Wow. Really see, it. look, there's the different cells in the stalk. Oh, fair income it is too. What other, I'm sure there's a couple other mutations there were too. Oh, yeah, an STM mutation. That means it's a shoot meristemless. It hasn't got this shoot in the meristem. That's white, that's oxen. So that was a mutant that came up like that. That was because that mutated because I cut the bottom of it, not cut it because it was injured and it didn't come out correctly. But that's the reason and that's what it formed. Oh, no, is there any others? What's this one? Oh, this is just cotyledon breaching, branching. So that's probably just an overexpression of a gene. That's probably not a mutation. So there's a bit of a difference. That's pukin, that's nukin crossed pink death bubba, no, glucan crossed pink death bubba, and that was nukin crossed gorilla glue 4. So it's really nice. And that's just been crossed with pineapple chunk, and the outcome, the progeny, that's called lollies, because it tastes like opening up a big bag of lollies, and if you shake them up and open it up, that's what it smells like. It's incredible. 
mutations. All right, back to it, uh, this one. So this is well, the normal difference vegetation index shows the amount of action or photosynthesis on a plant leaf. So you can see how the leaf, it starts to age and get sick, or in this case, it looks like it's drying out. So you can see the action, the red is the amount of, see sound here, nothing's been reflected. So that's the amount that's being absorbed. And right up here, everything's been reflected, the whole spectrum. So you can see the different contrasts. And then if you go up here too, you can see what the different effects are on a healthy or a stressed plant. So once the leaf, the chlorophyll or the photosynthesis uptake on that happens very well and successfully until it's stressed. And then you can see in a stressed plant, it absorbs a little bit more, which is not good because it's trying to activate its immune system instead of activate its growth and development pathways. So by doing that, it's going to age itself faster and get sicker faster. So it was just a cool graph showing through the NDVI index, NDV index, sorry, about um, how the photosynthesis works in plant leaves. And if you get all your genetics right, this is what you can expect. Something looks quite nice. But see, this is only visual, remember? So does it got the medicinal properties you want? Does it have all the right appeal? Does it have the different terpenes and things that are going to synthesize to elevate your THC or bringing that? There's been a new paper released that I'll go through a little bit later that shows a few terpenes in specific that when they mix with THC, that enhances THC. Oh, I was amazed. Uh, limonene is one of them, geralinol. So, so if you have, for instance, the limonene, oh, I'll just get, it's just so exciting. Getting too far ahead of myself. I'll go through that lot later though. So this is just some nice examples. If you get your genetics right, and then you can grow and have everything producing the genetic potential, you'll be blessed with this kind of goodness. Oh, actually, there's been a bit of chat action. I'll put it up to that one. Good morning, Poops. How are you, Poops? Nice to see you, mate. Stress by. Oh, that was if the plant, those chlorophyll pigments were, if it's just under stress in general. So that was just showing how the age of the leaf was going down. Good morning, Dave. How's it going? Oh, yeah, light temp. Yeah, just the abiotic or biotic stresses that if the plant was, oh, I'll get rid of that first. Now I'll go back to share and explain a bit better. Uh, I got this PowerPoint to go through yet, all the genetic improvements in agriculture and to show all the different types of things. It's new plant biology stuff. That's, a, that's a, nearly a speech in itself. Um, what was up to? Then there's another one over here I'm going to go through too about what's the role in plant breeders, how to successfully put s stress resistance into your progeny as well. So today it's pretty massive. Uh, Poops asked, went a few back. He wanted explanations about this one, the NDVI. So why, why was this shriveled, he said. Um, to me, well, it's not deficient. It's not diseased. I can't see any you know, hypersensitive reactions on it. There's no, it, it looks like it's de desiccated. It's just shriveled up. But it's a typical plant response reflectance when the plants are aging or they're getting they're not, you can see the difference down here, the green, which it's reflecting more than the red. So it's still trying up in this bit. So in this part of the leaf here, it's still trying. But it's, um, yeah, because it's desiccated. I hope that answers it, mate. I didn't explain that very well, did I? And this is some um, terminology that they're starting to say, what's going on? Are we, should we use sativa or indica labels anymore? Because um, they've also got chemotype they're based on all the chemicals and terpenes that's mixed in with them because it's all changed. The cannabinoids and terpenes are the real dictators of potential effects and the therapeutic properties called the entourage effect. That's what that new paper studies, the how TH, some terpenes can enhance THC's effect. Plant hormones in stress reactions. Uh, this is testing. Uh, all right, 
So this is to do with different plant hormones. So you know there's five basics and four or late new ones. There's your gym. Oh, yeah, this has got most of the new ones. So there's your oxen, cytokinins, ethylene, abscisic acid, and they're the first five ones. I can name five. And then the other ones are your jasmonic, salicylic, strigololactones, and brassinosteroids, the other ones that are very common in plants that they need for the growth and development in veg and in bloom, where some are just specific to veg or bloom like florigen in flowering. Anyway, this one says um, that from high light, what this says is overall it's the plant's reactions to stress. So does it activate what pathways? So if you locally put stress in, it will systemically go and activate jasmonic acid in a lower way, but it'll increase salicylic and abscisic acid from high light. So if you wound it, you're going to reduce jasmonic acid locally and throughout the plant, but you're going to increase abscisic acid through the locally and systemically, which isn't good because abscisic acid, it stops all pathways, it halts it, it activates the immune system. And from acclimatation, so from the too hot or too cold acclimation, so you're still going to abscisic acid, you're going to activate those pathways. This is just showing how important it is to have the plant under the right conditions. Uh, oh, that explains the whole thing. I'll just explain it, I suppose. Uh, pollen. This is a cool study done on pollen. So I'll put this up just to show the effects on pollen because, as you know, pollen desiccates very fast and that's the whole reason why it goes infertile very fast, sort of within the hour. Cannabis pollen can just, just shrivel up so fast and then it's inviable. It won't go, it won't germinate through the pollen tube. It won't um, germinate. And this is an example up the top here. So it just shows here the pollen rehydration. So non-rehydrated is here. Then after 30 minutes, they've rehydrated it and you can see the shapes of them. So they kind of look like the stom stomata. Oh, excuse me. And here they're round. So they're in the little coccus form. So there's a big difference. And actually pollen, while we're on that, I think there's a pollen. Oh, I was going to do pollen theory. Go through. Sure, I've got it. Where is it though? Uh, pollen. Well, this is the female and male plant parts, cannabis parts, those reproductive parts. So you've got your the outside bit, the sepal, S-E-P-A-L, and then inside is the anthers or bananas, as commonly called. You can see they actually do look like a banana, and they're attached to a little filament down the bottom. And then down on the female bits, it's a big bract. It's called the perigonal bract. And then up here, you've got your stigma up the top of it where it accepts the pollen tube. So the pollen comes in and lands here, and then it germinates, and it comes down the stigma and then into the style, which is at the base of the bract, and then it goes down into the micropyle, and then it pollinates either the egg cells or the mother cell, which is a, a triploid, it produces triploid offspring in the centre. You know, it'll do for that bit. Um, uh, that's not what I'm to show. Uh, seed maturation. No, this is to do with breeding. Not seeds, uh, a bit lost. What's that? Poops. Poops is out of something. Uh, people clueless asking for sativa. <laughs> yeah. Um, you take on silicate. Um, silica. Yes, silica is a... It's a quasi element and it's a, it's not essential for cannabis, but it's beneficial. So it's really important to in, in, have it in your nutrient program somehow. You can get it from various ways um, organically. Oh, does touching pistols kill them? Render useless while manually pollinating? Excellent question, mate. Yes, it doesn't. It doesn't help them at all. 
it's you'll see them start to shrivel up when they're starting to uh, they're not be they're not happy they just shrivel so if you brush your fingers over and things like that it'll sense that and it'll start to shrivel so that's not good it can't complete its full reproductive cycle like it would because it's under a bit of stress whereas if it was just sitting out normally it would have like a ping a pom pom effect it's like a pom pom I call it because they're all sticking out looking like a pom pom and that's perfect because it can complete its you know it's 40 day or 60 whatever day it depends on your cultivar cycle that it needs to complete and did you know here's something too by cutting the pistils in half so the anthers if you get them I'll show up here you cut them in half you can actually that stresses them out so much where they don't grow upwards anymore they spread sideways the bracts or the calyxes I've made a video on that if you want to watch it. There was another question come through. Poops asked, so you want to drop pollen without touching the pistils? Ah, I, well, short answer, no, because you're starting, they, they will germinate very fast. Like um, within the hour, they'll start and germinate. And then that's the time where it will start and kill itself off anyway. So it's real fast in that action. So when I pollinate, I'll get the, you store the pollen grains in the pollen sack or the sepal. That's how I store it. And then you can store it for a long time. You're just looking at a blank screen here. I should at least talk about that. Uh, so, well, that's about storage. You ask till you touch them. Then I'll get them. I'll get, um, the, I'll open up a, a, the sepal, the pollen sack. And then I'll grab, there's usually about five, seven anthers or pistol, um, bananas inside. And then you'll cut the end off one of them and then hold the other end in your tweezers. And then I'll drag that and you'll see a little puff come out sometimes. And then I'll, um, I'll drag that over the pistols of the main plant that I've selected to pollinate. And then I'll like rub it in there and then you'll see white stuff on the top. And then I leave the anther on top of that pistol, that little um, the floral section that I've the bud that I've gone and pollinated, so I know that it's got it's been pollinated, and I'll do that. I'll use five anthers and get about twenty to thirty seeds. Next question. I hope that helped, mate. Update me if it didn't. Oh, poop says found using toothpick works well to drop pollen versus a Q-tip. Ah, this is another technique. Very good. That's good. And tap tap and drip yes all these techniques there's there's so many ways to grow and breed cannabis that's for sure hey who 420 how's it going mate you come in for a good show mr fair bit but anyway back to it i'm gonna talk about i think that was all of the plant ones so i'll get into that discussion on the uh this one What's a role of plant breeders? So as a plant breeder, you want to manage the stresses. So you've got to have inside of your progeny stress management. There's too many offspring or seeds coming out these days that doesn't do that, or they only test it once over a run. They don't test it under the conditions multiple times or put out multiple progeny to try and test it. So a role of a plant breeder is you want nutritional security, you say you want all of your terpenes and your cannabinoids to be retained and then you want your stresses to be managed and then early variety with su sufficient yield. So if you can, there's a ELF gene, it's called, uh, early finishing gene, and I've pulled that out of a ruderalis cultivar and I've installed it into my Indica lines. And now I get uh, a day, well, day 50, there's zero uh growing the zero growth you can see all the anthers they're all red so there's no old well, pistols there no more growth is happening and that's at day 50 and it's big and chunky and nice so that's how i know that gene has been transferred actually i'll get through later on there's quite a few charts and i'm going to go through on how to do gene transfers and how to do your marker assisted selecting as well to make sure that those progenies been those genes have been accepted and then you can see in what ratio they've been accepted if they're a dominant uh, transfer or if it's a recessive transfer um, I'll come up with, I'll show you how to do that a little bit later agricultural improvements well you know that corn when it first came out it was this small so this is they talking about genetic mod 
genetic engineering, genetic modification. So look at the size of it, top right here. This is when it first came out. It's been fiddled with to make the corn that you see these days. Concepts of a gene. No, I'm going to skim through this because this is going to really drag on, I reckon. Because today's going to be big. Pure line theory is a theory where you self-pollinate or inbreed to increase the homozygotic, which is the stability of your genetics. Uh, pure line theory ends by Johansson. Johansson's pure line theory. He's the one that came up with that. And here's an example of him testing his seed size through his theory. So he went and inbred and, and seen on, of the offspring on what seed sizes came out from that. And he found that they were pretty much the same. Because when you do an inbreed, it should be a 100% genetic copy of what you've copied from if there's no mutations and everything's gone the way it should go. Conclusion of the experiment, no. Back crossing. Back crossing is when you'll mix with one of the parents. So you'll have two offspring. I need a chart for this. Where's my canvas? Seed mutation. Plastids. I need to bring up. I'm just, sorry, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to find another chart which is to do with breeding. Because I'll be referring to a lot of genetics. Uh, all right, just looking for it. Here's pollen theory. I'll get that one up for later. Um, you want the breeding. So it would be in. Sorry, bear with me for a sec. Um, I'm trying to find a better slide so I can explain things a bit better. Lives, animal flustered. All right, here we go. I'm getting closer to the section I want. Can of slides are made. Here we go. Where's the breeding one? There it is. Sweet. Now I've got to share the screen for you to see. Present, share screen. Apply screen. Oh, gee. Um, Why was I explaining this again? Geez, so I've got the right slide. I'm just off a bit of, I'm off track now. Oh, that's right. Back crossing. So back crossing is, brings, well, you can't bring them across. Back crossing is when you cross, you have the two parents. So this is the making of pink death bubber, where it has death bubber here and island pink there. So back crossing would be breeding back with one of these parents. So for the progeny here in the first generation, I would breed back with Death Bubba, for instance, to try and grab the traits from, from her that I wanted. And then, then I'd keep back crossing until I got the traits that I wanted and they were desired. And that's usually about six odd times, generally. Uh, I've had it, cut, had, had it go very much faster than that with successful gene transfers, but that's um, how to do the back cross that is explained here. So it's when you cross, the crossing of your F1, the first, Friar of progeny, that's what the F stands for, with one of the parents. Uh, the re this is pretty important, so I'll read it. The, re the recurrent parent should be well adapted and should pro possess all the desirable traits except for the characteristic concerned in back crossing. So in other words, you want to pull all the traits that you want out of that plant, those genes, into that the new ones, that's what you're looking for, out of gene transfer. The donor parent should have a specific trait of interest. The characteristics should be highly heritable and several generations of back crossing is needed in most instances. Here's how to back cross method for a dominant gene transfer. Uh, oh, who's got a question? Uh, I'll just explain this one, Huda. Actually, what is it? Buddha says, what's the best way of separating male and females if you have several tents in the same room? I'll go back and answer that one. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing first day. Actually, I'll put up this screen. So who to ask, what's the best way of separating males and females if you have several tents in the same room? 
Uh, well, as soon as you get your pre, you want to pre-flower. So as soon as it comes up in like the fourth to sixth node, you'll see a little pre-flower come up in the fourth or sixth week of veg. And then inside of that, it'll tell you that you'll see little round things, which you'll separate. And if you see little furry, little the anthers sticking up, the pistils, that means you'll keep them there because that's female. Uh, that's the best way to do it. And then it, it won't stuff up your run. And you don't, you don't want to test them in flip. That's the best way. Check out the pre-flowers. And then Hooter asks again, as it is how to stop accidental cross-pollination. AS, arsenic is, no. As it in how, or how do you stop accidental pollination? You've got to make sure that the plants don't pollinate the other ones. How do you stop accidental? Well, why would it be an accident? So that means that you've got cultivars that are herming, I'd guess. So how do you stop herming? Well, herming is a stress technique where it's put out where a little bit of stress is talking about to, uh, that's what, how you're initiating that and showing it's heterozygosity. Hudo also says, sorry, I'm talking about if I want to breed plants. Oh, how do you have males in one tent and the other? So how do you stop accidental pollination if you want to breed plants? You want to run, don't do, uh, do a monocrop, not a polyhybrid crop. Don't just do one cultivar at a time in one tent, and then you won't have a chance in cross-pollinating them. That's If you've got a very heterozygotic line, that's how I'd go about doing it. Have males in one tent, females in the other. Yeah, you have to do that because otherwise you're going to have offspring when they when they breed. Um, I'm a bit confused there. Hooter, if it didn't help by what I've said, can you rechange the question, mate? Uh, I'll get back into the have males. Yeah, I'll just you know, I'll get back into the other one. Oh, mate, get out. brother, how's it going? Nice to see you. Poop says HEPA filter between tents. Yes, there you go, Hooter. Poops is helping. That stops the pollination. Scrub the exhaust. Yes. I, th ah, I understand what he's saying now. Yeah. So if one pollinates in one tent, how do you stop it transferring to another one? Poops has answered the question. Thanks, mate. <laughs> oh, it's good to have knowledgeable people around. Uh, okay, I'll get back into the sharing. Poops, yes. Here we go. Just This just come through. Hooda says, I'm worried about getting pollen on my clothes and accidentally pollinating. So would I, mate. That's why you've got to do, when you're doing your selective pollination, you've got to really do it, turn fans low. Uh, that's what I always make sure I do. The fans are off even. Um, and the, pollen, the selective breeding that you're going to be putting out, you want to make sure that it's in the corner of the room unless you're doing an open pollination to pollinate everything because there's a chance it can ru ruin everything. And if you're worried about that, if you're using that much pollen that gets on your clothes, I would do um, just wear a lab coat or just take off the your clothing or somehow mitigate it that way. Use a piece of clothing for an each different room that you go into. Walking lightly, g'day mate. Coming in late, there's nothing wrong with that. Poops uh, so says they can happen, but not as a big deal as you might think. Yes, that's exactly right. Thanks for bringing it up, Poops. People think it's you got a little bit of pollen. It's going to go and ruin everything. You get it's so little that it it pollinates. Like before, when I said I use about uh, what is this sharing? Share screen. I use about five anthers, and I get about what thirty to fifty. Uh, yeah, this one will do. I use about, I pluck off about five of these. I'll cut one of the ends open. I'll grab that with my scissors, my, sorry, my tweezers first, cut the ends open over the buds that I'm going to be doing. And then this is one that's been induced. This is a death bubba. So this is what it wants to look like after it's been successfully pollinated. Oh, uh, actually, no, this one was reversed. This one, you put silver to block the ethylene and that reverses the, the genetics so you can test males or females. 
Um, but yeah, I cut five of these and it produces about 30 odd seeds, maybe 50 at the most seeds, mate. Because each pollen grain inside of that, there's thousands inside of each one and it has to go and land right on top of this anther here. So the chances of that happening are so low and then its viability also is very low. It only lasts for probably 60 minutes at the most in ideal conditions, the cannabis pollen. So it's um, unless you do an open pollination where you do this, for instance, put this and then the fans to the left and the crops to the right, that will, once one of these break, one pollen grain goes out and then it has a higher chance. But manually pollinating, it's a very low chance. While I'm here, we most, oh no, I'll answer the questions as it was wanted. Um, poops, yes, well done, Poops. Poops also says spewing male sacs are the issue. Filter that. Spewing the, <laughs> the cephals are an issue. Yeah, right, right, back to it. So I was going through the agricultural one. This one, the backroom method. So you, if you want to re read, to cut a long story short, it's a similar way of what it was explained. You've got your two parents and you cross your progeny back with the parents that you want to pull the genes out of. So you'll have, this, you'll have, uh, you make seeds, the first one, it'll grow up. Then you plant the seed, which is this first one, it grows up. Then you have to induce that and get the pollen from that and back cross the pollen from this with the next offspring. So the easiest way I do that with is I will grab and keep pollen from a cultivar that I've selected. So after a pheno hunt and you like that cultivar, it's doing its right thing. It's got the terps and the cannabinoid profile and everything else, the structure, et cetera, you want. I'll induce it with silver, block the ethylene, and that will make it produce pollen and I'll store that. And I've successfully repollinated five years after having it stored. So it's a fantastic way to doing this method. So then you grow the first one up, you'd pollinate it manually, you'd find one that works, and then you grab seeds off that after it's finished doing, then you plant another seed, and then you repeat until these progeny that you want has the offspring that is desired. So keep repeating and then find it and then test it. And to be honest, I've never done it this many times to get what I've wanted out of it. For instance, like my early finishing gene, uh, that's pretty easy to do out with the morphogenic expressions. I have to tell you about the different marker existed. Actually, we're going to come up to that. Disadvantages of back crossing. Marker assisted breeding. So when you're doing marker assisted breeding, there's three types that you can do. Morphological, which is done through visual. You can just look at things. You can see shape, size, color, etc. Biological, which is when you put stains and stuff and use it through the microscope. And then molecular is through DNA electron scanning microscopes. And when you want to use your qPCRs and your other gas chromometers and your other lab techniques. So this is, if, unless you're in a lab, you can only do the first two. And the first, and this is limited by a compound microscope unless you've got one of those. So really the first one, everybody can do. And that's the one that I'm talking about, morphological or visual markers that you can pull out from your plants. So then like with the early finishing gene, so I went and did the gene transfer. So for me to see if it's successful with this morphological marker, I've got to wait and see, well, when's the plant finishing? Did the first progeny, did this first cross that came out on the second cross that come out, did it have the trait that I was reside? In other words, did it grow up and did it finish at day 50? So it's either a yes or no. So it's pretty easy to test different gene transfers that you want to do. What's another one? Uh, systemic acquired resistance gene transfer. That's another one that I've tested quite easily. So you'll do it in the progeny, you'll grow up and you'll test and you'll throw it in conditions that will be, let me grow up, I've got a few charts of this. I'll show you. Because cool as gene transfer, what am I looking at? Uh, Plant science. Uh, there it is. Systemic acquired resistance. Activating the plant's immune system or having prime genes. 
So I'm going to show, do you want to see here again? Can't give away all my little hints. What was I talking about? Uh, activating genes to see if you can see the gene expressions. Uh, there's no photos in this one that are the one that I wanted to show you. All right, I'm going to go back to another folder because I know they're there. It's in the videos I've made. because I've tested the offspring in those. Bids made. Uh, fungal resistant genetics, where is it? Fungus resistant genetics, here it is. Uh, which one do I want to show you? So we're talking about doing a test. Okay, there it is. There's the test. So this is how you do a test. Oh, you, you, you saw all that shit. Okay, oh. <laughs> I was still sharing. Very good. So this is the test. So I put out four progeny, and you want to see if the genes being transferred successfully. So from putting four out, you will get, if you get three out of the four testing for it, that's a dominant gene transfer. If you get one of the four, that's a recessive gene transfer. If you get a one is to two is to one, it's a semi-dominant transfer. Here, I got a four out of four. So that means it's a 100% gene transfer. And I go, I've gone on to test it later on, and it's also the it's been successful the first time around. So it was such a good uh, gene transfer that it worked all right. So this was just more so an activation of a gene because it's a systemic acquired resistance. I induced a resistance into it and that formed systemically, which turned on the WK, oh, it's W something, KY29 gene. And that's the systemic acquired resistance gene. And it's, in other words, it's activated and primed. You can see here, only the dead cells have the spores on them. So when they were on the live cells, the spores can't even germinate. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, that's enough for that. Where was I to? Back to this. So any questions? No. You can see on the thing out. That's good. So disadvantages of back crossing. So the new varieties will not be superior compared to the recurrent parent. In other words, they can't be any better. So all you're trying to do is grab genes out of it. You can't grab heterosis or hybrid vigor. You can't grab anything high yield or anything better out of it, really. Um, and also another disadvantage of that crossbreeding is closely linked determined genes may be transferred with the target gene. So, yeah, you're not transferring one gene. As a cannabis plant has 35 odd thousand genes, you're transferring half of the parent. So you've had a chance in transferring 20,000, 10,000 genes. So you might get ones that you don't want. Another disadvantage is highly time consuming. It can be if you don't use marker assisted breeding technology or you know, marker assisted techniques. Molecular, no, that's in the staining. So there's cool ways you can get it, but you've got to get yourself a compound microscope. This is an example of marker assisted back crossing uh, of done drought tolerance as well. Uh, so they've got a drought susceptive cultivar. You think, how can I bloom and improve this? This is my keeper, but it's just so sensitive in high uh, drought conditions. So you, you get your drought tolerant or resistant cultivar and you want to pull out that tolerant gene out of it so it can be sweet in the conditions that you want. So you go and do this back crossing method until you can find a drought um, tolerant cultivar that's come out of it. And I've done that too. And you test those by planting seeds from people, well, people who haven't done this, and then next to your ones, the progeny that you hope that have it, and then you'll put them under very um, lax conditions. I've got a photo of it too, where you can see mine that are just still upright, and then the ones that have haven't had this installed into them, that they're wilting. Importance of marker-assisted breeding. So it's highly reproducibility, highly reproducibility. It's high reproduce, it highly reproduces. Okay, good. It's less to, way less time consuming. The early detections of the traits, because you can see them really early because they got a marker on them. So you don't have to go and wait four or five rounds to try and detect them. It's, you can see them virtually straight away. Small samples needed. Yep, you don't even have to put out heaps like I was just showing before. It's yeah, cost-effective. Recessive alleles can be identified by knowing that the 
doing your four to one test, you'll know which ones are recessive. Not getting, there's all different ways of breeding, incomplete dominance, there's incomplete recessiveness, there's uh, generation skipping, there's all different types and that's just so, I did a course, it was, uh, it was a 15 week course on genetics and genomics. So it was all to do with very technical things like that, where if you, you put in different examples, what offspring can you, offspring can you expect? Codominance, there you go, how to mix with colors, how to fiddle with colors, a monohybrid versus a dihybrid. So it depends on how much homozygotic you've got it to heterozygotic. So this is a land race over here, can only show if once you breed it, you're gonna get only a couple of different phenotype expressions. Where if you've got your hybrids, where they're very heterozygotic, meaning there's heaps of crosses into them and they're not stable, you're gonna get a lot more phenotype expressions coming out of them. That's what this is explaining in a long story short. The approaches to plant study. Oh, cool, this is that little, so the analyzing of inheritance patterns of the phenotype. So you're just gonna put out four seeds to test your progeny. As an example, you don't have to go and put out 400 or hundreds like people say. Uh, so you wanna see what patterns are gonna come out. So if you've got a three is to one, that's the dominant trait, the dominant gene. And if you've got the gene you're looking for is only one of your offsprings got it out of three, out of four, it's a recessive trait. And if it's one is to two is to one, it's a semi-dominant. Hey Lars, how you going, mate? I see ya. Cannabis breeding, what am I here for? Is that the agriculture one? Okay, drought resistance installation. Uh, acetic acid enhances drought tolerance more in female than in males. So what you can do is vinegar has acetic acid in it. So you can go and make your plants tolerant through that. That's one way. I did it a different way, but um, that's just one way. This is explaining it here and the different pathways in which it turns on and turns off. Genetic purity. Yes, if you go and stuff with your genes too much, you're going to not maintain your genetic purity. Um, and this is an example of how it shows here in which it's wandering when you're getting genetic distortion, as it's called. So if you've got the project, you've just done too many breeds too many times and inbred it too many times, excuse me, and it's just wandering. The genes that are in there aren't lining up with each other. When the two plant mixes with each other, it goes through recombination, it's called. When the genes are recombinating and they're trying to align with themselves, to work out which ones are compatible, which ones aren't, which sick gene sequences are going to stay, which ones haven't, the codons aren't written correctly and they'll be chopped off. So when you do your inbreeds, a lot of those codons that aren't successful, they get chopped off. So you can reduce your gene numbers that way and have genetic deterioration. Okay, double haploids. This is cruel as. So this is a way where you can get homozygotic straight away in your first progeny. You think, whoa, that can't be done. You've got to have at least eight years to do it, man. No, nope. you can do it real fast through dihaploidization. So in the last decades, alternative and more advantageous techniques have been successfully used. These techniques based on androgenesis and genogenesis to obtain pure double haploid lines, and they're mostly done in cell culture, in vitro, tissue culture. I'll be talking about tissue culture in a few weeks. Uh, and through the plants, the embryogenesis or callogenesis is through the male gametophytes, which is the male pollen, which is the, uh, that bit, that's the pollen grain. Those pollen grains come out of these anthers so that's what this is talking about. That's the male gametophyte. Come on, no. <laughs> oh, wow. And then it goes on the female gametophyte, or, uh, that male pollen, or, and it's precursor to the microspore, the androgenesis, yes. And the female gametophyte, the megaspore, known as gymnogenesis. 
So these double haploid technologies are alternatives to normal pollen or egg cell development and must be in tissue culture. From the standpoint of plant breeding, double haploid technology reduces a typical seven to eight generations of self-fertilization or inbreeding needed to stabilize a hybrid genotype. So it's much faster, much cheaper. There's so much benefits for doing this. And, and then it goes on to say about the genetic mapping can easily be done as well. So it's um, just technology. You can always do this. Uh, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. Just going to show this. That's an example about that crossing. Microassisted breeding. Yes. Ah, this will be discussed a lot. I've got a big talk on this. Oh, there's a few. I'll see what Lars is talking about. Lars might have a cool question. So what's Lars saying? Hey. He's trying to do double haploids. Well done, mate. Watch the show in a few weeks' time with um, tissue culture because it's um, really cool. Nobody knows how to do embryogenesis from Callus yet. That's Callus, C-A-L-L-U-S. The Callus is the, is the plant's buildup in the plasmodesmata in between the cells. That's a Callus. It's like a blockage between the cells and plant tissue. But Callus is the one that uh, plants form their undifferentiated cells, they're called parenchyma cells, and that's where embryogenesis happens because you want to start new life from it. Uh, nobody knows how to do that. Okay, well, I'll show you in a few weeks. I've also made videos on how to do it too. Um, I'm probably going to get it done, says Lars, with marker-assisted back crossing before I crack embryogenesis. Do both of them, mate. <laughs> it's all good fun. Um, all right, back to the sharing. Low slides. Yeah, this is so cool. If you can picture or remember anything, remember this slide. Right. So to get genetic gain out of your progeny, there's so many things that you've got to try and include, and this is them. So it breaks down to a maths formula. I'm not going to go with that because no one likes maths. So you want your molecular markers. So if you can see your molecular markers, that's going to help you gain your genetics because you're going to be putting them through and you'll test, for instance, my early finishing gene. So if I can put that as a marker and I see it, that's my genetic gain because I can finish early. That means I can get uh, an extra crop out once per year. Genetic par par parameters, addictive, dominance, epistasis. Uh, so do genes... Epistasis, actually, I'll put this in here. That's it. I'll just read it for you. Because I because people are going, what's epistasis? Ah, oh, it's not here. Uh, actually, it's up here. Epistasis meaning. Here you go. So it's when one gene locus masks or modifies the phenotype of a second gene. So again, it's just when one gene masks or modifies the second gene. So that's what you get when you have the epistasis. So that's one of the things that you'll want in genetic variants. So you'd have to be aware of your genetics beforehand, in other words, and your germplasm, it's the same thing, it's what genes have been used, creations of variation. So gene editing and gene modification. So you wanna be aware of what's going on before it, not just get a plant and go, rad, it's gonna work. You want to know a bit of the background if you want genetic gain. The second thing is heritability. So you want to know your statistical methods, your phenotype variants and environmental variants to estimate your genetic gain. So if you've got your environmental variants too, um, it's too hot, too cold, you're never going to get genetic gain. So that's an example of it. Uh, phenotypic variants would be that chart before where I showed where out of homozygotic or land race strains you get maybe two or three phenotype swings, where out of a heterozygotic you maybe get nine different phenotype swings. That's an example of that variance. What populations have you used? Have you used a lot of them in the past? Has it been worked out? Uh, selection intensity, so the population size. Have you selected too much and it's too much allelopathy is happening and it's causing too much gene transfer within the plants and it's actually not working in favour because plants, they want to try and reproduce and they want their own space to them. Piss off everyone. Oh, go away, everyone else. You know, they want their own space. So have you used too much? 
selection proportion. Have you got the right proportions? It's sort of similar. Selection targets. We know the target genes that you're trying to select. Then what selection methods? What marker-assisted selections have you used? Because they're very in different ways to get different outcomes. And selection prior priorities, favourable alleles in your marker selections. Yes, that's why you're doing it. Um, cycle time. So gene shuffling and recombination. So in your marker selections. So make sure that's actually cycled properly because if you let your... Oh, here's a good example. If you let your progeny not go through the right times, if you want to say harvest at day 19, 18, there's a high chance that it hasn't gone through maturation of your progeny yet. So you're not going to get the outcome that you would have desired. Uh, cycle time. Breeding true is... is it, is it a haploid? Is it true? Is it, um, what type of offspring do you get? What type of offspring is it? Haploid? Genetics? What type of chromosomes? Um, that would be into the homozygotic or the heterozygotic. And off-season selection. Mark resisted in your phytotrons. <laughs> you know your phytotron? That's a rad name, isn't it? Phytotron. What the hell is that, man? That's a research facility, plant facility. It's your phytotron, it's called. So have you got the seasons correct in your phytotrons? In other words, is it um because that's all goes with seasons, you know? If you can it just be an annual plant, you want to make sure that the, the sun's in the right times when you're doing your um, manipulations. There you go. Has anyone got any questions for that? Because that's I really love this. This explains everything. If if you can do all these things, you've you've won. So I'll stop sharing. As Lars written, I'm doing them with all the same. Okay, no real questions. Back crossing, done that. Marker assisting breeding. Yes, it's just so advantageous. Here's another example of a gene transfer. So if we want to transfer myrcene. Myrcene is a terpene in cannabis that is very, very good for pain. So if you want a, if your cultivar doesn't have it, if you think, oh, I want to bloom and change this, well, you can. You just want to do the normal back crossing and then you want to do marker-assisted selection. So you'll go out and you'll get your progeny and you'll select and, and test your progeny. And then in this case, this is a just a random uh, gene transfer, random recombination. It's the offspring has 25% chance none, 6% chance yes, and... On this side, it's got a lower chance that it's been accepted. So another 25% chance that these alleles have been transferred across. So you can transfer any genes that you want. Uh, this is an example of the times on how fast marker-assisted selection is. So you can do your marker-assisted breeding, yes, and then you want to do marker-assisted selection. Because over normally, you can see, yeah, you definitely have to go through seven generations before you can actually get the traits that you want or six generations. But over here, you'll select them straight away, make sure that they test straight away, bang, you're on a winner. Then you can go and strengthen, and stabilise up those genes and produce offspring with the desired traits that you want. Kind of skipping a lot, but... Uh, central dogma. This is explains how phenotypes swing through proteins. So DNA stays the same, just going through, but your RNA, ribonucleic acid, can, can change through different processes. So here it's got your DNA encodes to your so it transcribes, then your RNA translates to your protein, and then that's translated this message. So your RMNA, your, your messenger RNA has got a code in it that it's just come to it from another signal round. So you've got your genes coming in, then it's got a code coming in, and then, oh, shit, it's getting too cold. I better code this way. So it puts a, a code out, it transcribes, and then translates into the protein. 
And that protein activates different pathways for development. And that's your phenotypic swing when it does that. There you go. There's your phenotype right in there. So this is how it swings from your actual genotype to your phenotype. Rapid screening. I like that. It's pretty weak. Oh, that's the last one. Okay. Well, that's it for that. Good. Done one. And will this be now for an hour already? Probably halfway through it. Any questions? No. All's good. All right. What's Lars doing? He's doing the same them at the same time. I'm just saying one will win. Uh, that's right, mate. Keep And keep writing it down too because remember science is only when you write it down. If you don't write it down, it can't be science. That's As Mythbusters say that. What's this? Oh, here's a bit of – got some ones up here that I'll show you before I get on to the big talk about women more breeding. Um, disjointed. Hot policies put dopey Australia behind the rest of the world. Yeah. There is so many uneducated folk around that it just leaves certain folk behind. And it's such a shame that Australia is really just interested in a lot of bro science, not interested in the grow science. Oh, well, good luck. I like this. Look at that. It looks like a bud, doesn't it? Then you think, hang on, there's an eye there. And then you go a bit further and you think, What? That's a frog. That's rad. That should have been shown at the start. I just thought, wow, that's so snazzy. Um, oh, yeah, this was to be brought up when I was talking about marker assisted breeding. And I'm just going to read it out because this is pretty important. This is from a book, a marker assisted breeding book. So the morphological traits we see in genetic markers. Some examples are shape, color of flowers, color in general, shape of the buds, shape of the seeds, um, shape of the characteristic of the nodes, spacing. Is the seeds all right? And you can see all these traits just by doing your marker-assisted breeding and selection techniques. So I don't have to read all that because I think I've skimmed through it. Uh, what's in plants? Yeah, good. Um, we've got up here anything needed to be said. Therefore, scoring of these markers is simple, rapid, and inexpensive. And often they can be scored even from presumed, pre um, preserved specimens. Yes, that's in tissue culture or in pollen culture. You can preserve them quite easily as well. A number of good visual markers. Yeah. And it's a shame that all these. Seed breeders that are out these days, they don't have any resistances in their progeny. I've got so many resistances, it's not funny. And as you see, it's so easy to do, but they just don't. Anyway, it's all about money for them. For me, it's all about, I'm in for the medical side of it, really only the medical side of it. I haven't made money off it. Uh, so I've just medically is the reason why I do all this research and the techniques that I do for medicine purposes because there's so many medical benefits in this plant. If you stay just on that. Oh, and I like this one because you can have, look at this, it shows just having a degree, what good does it get you? Yeah, you got a lot of knowledge, but can you get a result as you see with all these licensed producers or the major LPs going bust? Because they haven't got the skills. Quite blim and simple. I really like that. It explains so much saying so little. You can have so much in your head, but if you haven't practiced that or put your research to where your exp um, experience, where your knowledge is, what's the good of it? Because some things might not work. Uh, oh my, this is brilliant, brilliant. This is, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a video and I'm going to just do a talk just on this because this is insanely good and so beneficial for the cannabis community. It's selected cannabis terpenes. They enhance THC's effect by increasing the CB1 receptor activation. So they went, because, you know, THC, 
it activates the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So you can tell if that's been switched on and switched off. So what they've done is they've tested different terpenes in with by themselves and then with THC, and they can see that it's enhanced it. Not all terpenes, mind you. Remember I was saying limonene at the start and stuff like that? This is rad, though. This is just... Then look when it was done. Uh, it was like last month or something. So it's just the latest technology stuff. It's just brilliant, mate. Anyway, I'm going to go and show you. So they did, they've tested a lot of terpenes, but this is, it depends which cultivars too, but they, I don't think they tested cultivars. They only just tested um, the terpenes alone with the cannabinoids itself to see what active, to see what effect it had on the uh, receptors, the CB1 receptor. Mm. So these is all, that's the yeah, chemical breakdown of them all, actually. I don't need to see this. Yep, yeah, this is their sort of a base level test for their responses. So this is just to give a normal response. Actually, I'm going to get down. That's from the terpenes. Come on, where's the double lines? I'm all excited. Here we go. Look at this. Look at this. So pinene, for instance, or eucalyptol, geronol, limonene. Anyway, the first one, alpha pinene, it was tested. So the red line is the combination of both of them or the entourage effect, and the black line is just THC on itself. So for alpha pinene, look at that. It increased the effects of THC when you include pinene. Or limonene, look at this one. Massive amounts. So we usually smoke about 10% THC up here. So we're quite high. So if you put a little bit of limonene in with your THC, you're going to increase it a smidgen. So in smaller amounts though, if you get it down to the micron, so for people who are in edibles or have a low tolerance, they're going to get more of an effect, entourage effect from these combinations. I just love it. Remember OC me, that's the lowest volatile terpene in cannabis with CBG being the lowest volatile cannabinoid, which is around 60 Celsius or 160 Fahrenheit. And some of these can be identified by themselves, like terpenol. It smells like turpentine. That's the actual terpene that is pr predominant in turpentine. Linalool is the dominant terpene in lavender. Limonene is the dominant terpene in lemon. So you can, eucalyptol is eucalyptus trees for Australians or eucalyptus oil if you use it. So there's quite a few pine, pine trees. There's quite a few ways you can identify through marker assisted selection through your nose by using your receptors in your nose to see what terpenes you have. Keeping in mind though, that um, what there's like a thousand terpenes and the human nose, I think you can only smell three at once. Like if you put five smells in a room, it can only recognize three. For dogs, it's a lot more. But yeah, I love this study. I just love it. I haven't read through it fully yet, but uh, it's just the synergistic effect of the THC and the terpenes. It proves a brilliant outcome on the entourage effect that we've wondered about for years. How does it actually happen? This is kind of getting to the guts of how it happens. It's excellent. Right, any questions? Lars has written some stuff. Noise or Dave, what? It's amazing Australians always copies what America does, but they won't copy American with cannabis. Yeah, exactly well said, mate. Yeah, it's because there's too much money to be made in the Australian government yet. They're very greedy. Yeah, noise. Sure is. Reading's fun when you can get into it and the guts of it. Uh, this is solid evidence that distillate vapes were added with added terps do get you high. Yes, well said. Uh, I think this is the first time they've quantified the effects. Yeah, it's one of the first studies I've seen, mate. That's what got me so excited. I thought, you beauty, about blooming time. Interesting, Mersine doesn't look that big in a, look like a big effect. Um, if you have, remember the, uh, Terpene profiles of cannabis plants are, uh, if you've got one that's 5%, that's massive. If you've got one that's 3%, it's sort of doing well still. 
sort of a two, like a two percent would be the average, and then you break down out of that two percent, it's got fifty terpenes. So divide that into two, and then out of that, it's got myrcene. So the amounts are micron and very low with the amounts that they've got in them. Ah. Uh, I scroll too quick. Yeah, a few people have said that and a few people said I talk too fast too. I'm sorry, mate. Thanks for pulling me up. <laughs> uh, right, present, back to it. Present, it is, no it's not. You just cut out, entire screen. Yep, now I wanna go back to here. All right, finish that one, finish that one. Pollen hydration. I think I can, we haven't talked about pollen. This is actual pollen grain. So pollen grain have organelles or, you know, different types of things going on inside of them as well. They've got uh, the nucleus inside of them where they germinate from. They've got an exterior, an interior, a cell wall. So it's pretty cool. They look all different under the microscope too. And if you want, here's something between you and me. If someone's looked under a microscope and they've used water, they haven't looked at them because they're hydrophobic. So you've got to use uh, something that will keep them bound like Vaseline. Oh, no, I'm getting into that. Oh, that was a, that's the DWF gene. Here's a dominant DWF gene, an example. So this is a six week old plant and you can see the size of the little pill container there. That's the whole tight top of it. So I was working with that DWF gene. This is a good, uh, this is a, I has, uh, let's see, Death Bubba has a dominant gene, DWF gene in it. So when I'm doing breeding, I can either breed with it or choose a uh, recessive allele. So I'll put four up, three will come up small, one will come up normal. So I'll choose the normal one to breed with as an example. Uh, DWF, this can be overcome too by hormone. Oh, we're not talking about hormones. Oh, yeah. Lyle says, it was okay. Just scrolling past Mersine randomly. I saw it. That's cool. No, I'd like to be pulled up, mate, because I don't know. I'm here really. I'm not here talking to me. I'm here talking to you guys too and girls to help clarify or, you know, educate different topics so you can share it with other people too. So I appreciate those types of um, things. Uh, this one, this is what I was up to. What's this for? Oh, just how lab tests. So for, for future cannabis cups and things like that, they can do uh, a lot of testing will probably be done instead of visual and morphogenic testing. Uh, this is how to test. Didn't I talk about this before? Phenotyping technique. Well, if you want to test for your phenotype, there's a few different ways that you can do it. So if you want to test, so for your visual, which is your red, green, blue, so visually you can go and you can test for all these things. Oh, that's the different fields you're going to do it with. But your traits, so you can look at leaves, your biomass, the yield, the shape, you can't see photosynthesis and you can't, you can only just moderately see stress. On the right hand side, the legend, green is available, yellow is moderate, and red is not available. So that's for reading here, for testing. So if there's other thermal machines, fluorescent, 3D laser scanning, CT scans, multispectral and hyperspectral machines can all be used for determining different parameters in plants. And you can this is a chart that shows you which ones are the best for determining which outcomes. So for us, for doing our visual markers, we can pretty much do everything except for photosynthesis. And tell, you can't really tell the metabolism of the plant or how well it's photosynthesizing like that chart before with the normal vegetation differential index. Uh, do you know what your plant's water status is. Do you have drought resistance installed in your genetic line? Well, maybe do a test. So you have your test down, you have your one down, 
normal ones, and then you have your one that you think has got your drought resistance into it, so you'll plant them both. Then you'll stop watering, and then you'll see that the pressure that's gone inside, the water potential inside the plant has dropped to negative 0.3, and remember zero can only come up to zero, this is the max. Uh, and then after it dries out a bit by a few days, you'll rewater again. Well, the plant, the osmotic potential, the water potential inside it has dropped down to minus 1.0 in your potential drought tolerant, or it's dropped to minus 1.7 in your normal one. And then you let it recover, and then you'll see what's going on then, and it has your potential one recovered. It has. It's got 0 0.3 negative water potential. And then the other one, the normal one, is dead. And this is just a way that you can go and test your offspring to see if the drought resistance has been installed in your line. Uh, this is another rad study. This is evidence to show that the difference of the UV exposure on plant morphogenesis or plant growth. So as it's gone on, it's just shown, well, I'll read this. It's evident that UV in general is still broadly misunderstood and determined and detrimental to plants when not used properly, correct. This actual shows that UVB and assumes the same for UVC has virtually no commercial benefit for cannabis. Uh, well, that's not correct because he said, they said it a bit before, it's in different amounts. So it's to do with secondary metabolites because it's a form of stress. So therefore you activate the secondary metabolite pathway in the plants and if you put it under too much stress, you're going to get that outcome. You're going to get a plant that just doesn't like it and it stresses like us. Too much stress and we collapse. So this is what this test done. It was the extremes of UV exposure. So they left them on all the time. They didn't say what amounts, but they left them on all the time and you can just see what the effects is. So this one had not much and then more, more and the most. The same with down the bottom. So it's, it was under a nine week growth pattern down here. Uh, yeah, it was exposed to high UV levels. The image was taken just prior to harvest. It was nine weeks after the initiation of the UV treatments. Note the white, white spots that are on the adax, adaxial on the top sides of the leaves on the left. Uh, the black scale, it represents five centimetres or two inches. So it just shows that too much UV can really harm the plant, as we know already because it's the stresses. But if you want to initiate your secondary metabolite pathway and improve it, it will work. UV in plants. It's another study on UV. So this one's the UVB, and it's the is one of the set up here, one of the abiotic stresses that can significantly affect the secondary metabolite accumulation in plant tissue. Uh, the UVB is called significantly increase in lipid, lipid peroxidization and the total phenolic and flavonoid content and antioxidants activities in the shoots. So this was just proving that the antioxidants, sorry, that the UVB increased the secondary metabolite pathway and activating it quite well. I was done in vitro, as you can see. Is there any more? Is that the last one? Well, where's the HY5 gene? Sorry, I'm going to stop because there's a few more I missed out here. Wow, is that super cool? Yeah. Yeah, low level stress is the name of the game. Yes, well said, mate. He knows his stuff, doesn't he? He's not an early game. What else is there to show? Oh, that's right, I got that, yeah. It's already been going for an hour. Um, signaling effects of root development. No, that's for next week. Next week's, I think I was talking on roots, so I'm not going to. Is that trend in plant science? I'll talk about that next week for roots. I'm just looking to see what else is there to go. Oh, yeah, now we've got this one to go. I've got a PowerPoint. Actually, 
on our our point. So you can see that now. And if I go that one, no. Actually, which slide gets onto that? Where do we go? Screen again. Stop sharing. There it is. It's not working. Um, here we go. No. Because oh, yeah, this has got quite a few slides here, so I'm just going to get into the, the guts of it. Where was that start slide that I was at before? There. Genetic improvements in agriculture. So there's been so many genetic improvements from the science and technologies that's come out, and it's in the, more to do with breeding technologies. So this goes on about the past a lot. I should just nearly stop this and do another talk on this. Oh, anyway, I'll just keep going. Plant domestic, I'm not gonna, this has got like quite a few slides. I'm gonna skim over this. Plants and domesticated, yes. Gene modification, I want to get into the breeding side of it. This is how things changed from corn 7,000 years ago to now. GM food. Maize. Uh, polyploids. Didn't even touch about polyploids to do with breeding. Oh, far out. I'm doing a lot of polyploid breeding tests with uh, tetraploids and triploids. Didn't even go into that. Ask questions if you want, otherwise I'm not going to talk about it. Um, domestication through gene modification. There's some good stuff in here that I was going to, I thought this would be relevant. Yeah, that's the reason why getting into plant science is very beneficial. Back here, look at that, right up to it's not very good, but look now. This world population is so high, it's in, it's in, you're in a field that can't lose. That's why I thought if my medical cannabis fails, at least I'll be able to feed myself for the rest of my life. I love these old slides. So cool. Look at the old weather station. <laughs> There's Charles Darwin, the legend, and Gregor Mendel, the breeder. These peas. Uh, this is to do with breeding. So this is to do with a new crop. When they tested it, it tested extremely well. It had a resistance, a uh, really good um, BT resistance. I think it had in it. Uh, more tests. Advances in genetic technologies contribute to improved plants. Marker-assisted selection. Yes, everybody can do marker-assisted selection, but it's not talked about. This is how you, we've already talked about, it, actually. This is just another way that they go and do it. How markers work. Each generation, genes reassort or shuffle. They go through recombination. So can you see the markers? Hmm. Yes, it's easy to tell for putting resistance in because if it doesn't have resistance, it's just it hasn't been transferred. Markers greatly accelerate breeding programs. Yes. Submerged tolerance, survive, okay. Uh, like that was one that they've done in rice. They've gone and put a, actually this isn't a rice, we're talking about cannabis, sorry. Uh, Lars, I'm mixing up some Ori's Allen today, really? Good work, mate. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat there. That's pretty cool. So he's starting to play around with his chromosomes as well. Good work, mate. I've been doing that for a few years and I'm having some some amazing success out of it. Genome sequences. Yes. How to analyze. So a lot of people think you've got to do lab. You need a lab to go and be a breeder, successful breeder. You've seen here, just through markers, morphogenic expressions, Anybody can do it. By this, this is just a simple example. Is it resistant or is it susceptible? It's pretty cool. So 
GM example, insect resistance through introduction of a bacillus syringensis gene. And bang, big difference. Well, anyway, bacillus syringensis bacteria produce insecticidal proteins. It's heavily used in agriculture, BT as a spray. GM example of herbicide resistance. So the left side is where the rows are sprayed with herbicide and to eliminate the competing plants. And on the right side, it's been choked. So the plants compete with other plants for sunlight and nutrients. Many farmers use herbicides to eliminate weeds. Instead of getting herbicide, um, instead of getting their plant genetics resistant to whatever is the problem at that particular time. Herbicides tolerate plants are environmentally friendly. Herbicide, herbicide tolerant plants are environmentally friendly, yeah. But if you go and spray glyphosate, what happens? And kill, kill all the, the problems. You get all your groundwater leach, um, like in 95% of the lower 48 has pesticides in their groundwater for this reason. Gene flow through pollen movement has to be monitored and controlled. So gene flow through pollen movement, okay. In cannabis, we just want to make sure it's been recessed. So what you'll do is you'll get your, uh, you'll have your anthers up there. If you, once you do your manual pollination, you'll see within 24 hours, if that whole anther has shriveled, that means it's accepted your pollen. And if it hasn't, if it's still upright, that means that it hasn't accepted it. It's been an incomplete transfer. You can, see, you can also have uh, infertile pollen too, which would give that effect too, meaning that it hasn't gone, created a pollen tube and gone down the anther to start its producing your seed for you. Oh yeah, I'll just stop here. Actually, no, I'll read from the other thing. Everyone hit the like, oh yeah, thanks, Dave. Yep, 50 micromolar stock solution and 20 micromolar working concentration. Wow, good on you, Lars. He's into his plant science too. I like your work, mate. Uh, I use a different, I don't use Orizon. I use um, another one starting with C. Uh, martial artist, g'day, mate. Nice to see you. Lars says down the bottom, they breed a herbicide resistant plant by just killing tons of plants with herbicides. No transgenes needed. Yes, they sure do. Cisgenics, genes from the same plant are closely related. Transgrafting, that's another way to, try to get genes across. I haven't played around with grafting, so I'm not really going to speak much about it because I like to speak from experience too. Several new methods are available. Precise. Now, this gets into the more of the other phases of the macro-assisted breeding where it's your molecular. So you need labs to produce these sequences to run them through your, your machines. You go sequence them through a sequencer machine. Where are the challenges? Breeders can use more than one technology to address a challenge. That's why it's so rad, plant science. There's so many things. Macro-assisted breeding, genetic modification technology, genome wide widening applications, gene pyramiding to make sure that you've got the right structure to your genomics, to your genetics, improved agronomic practices to make sure that everything outside is going perfect as well, that you're not gonna have any gen, um, epigenetics starting to change. So you have a problem at the start and go through all these things and you'll get a solution at the end through successful plant breeders. That's it. For that one. Wow, getting down on it, skim through it all. Yes, yes, because we're talking, I like to promote health as well. Uh, Lars makes an extra point. Coltracine is toxic. Coltracine is a uh, poison used to uh, multiply chromosomes like orizalin. Coltrazine is extremely lethal and I don't advise anybody doing it. Um, yeah, orizalin is more, uh, sorry, coltrazine is way more toxic, like incredibly toxic. So these chemicals, that's why I don't even want to talk about them. But because they were brought up, I wanted to make it a safe point on it. But I generally, you won't have heard me 
mention those words ever for that reason because they're lethal. They're not just toxic. They're, they're flame and lethal. They're really dangerous to use. They should only be used in lab-type conditions. Um, the persons using them should also know what they're doing and not just being inexperienced, pulling up a bit of bro science, just getting it. So it's there's all sorts of – because you've got – you're putting these – poisons, lethal poisons into the plants and the plants, you're going to probably smoke them or use them or they're going to go into your substrates. So the safe handling practices aren't maintained by the average user. So, um, yeah, that's all I'm going to speak about that. Yeah, both are toxic. Yes, Lars knows that. It's so toxic you can't even have it shipped by MR. Well, it's just bad, mate. You don't. You have to have all sorts of PPE when you're using them, all sorts of stuff. It's... Um, only for the experienced. That's probably why I didn't get into the, my uh, research into ploidy with that. Uh, I think that's, is that it? I think that's it. Has anyone got any questions? I've done that, I've done that. I'm gonna go back to the slides. I'll show you all the slides to show what we've been through. Just to show you something that you're not looking at a blank screen, the blooming again. This one, signaling, that was next week. Yep, mutations, heterosis. Oh, I didn't touch on those things in the start. Oh, that's right. Heterosis, and I'll go backwards. Heterosis or hybrid vigor. It's a phenotypic result of successful gene interaction, and that generally happens in the first generation because you can't make better things from inbreeding and... Usually, and if you're back crossing, you generally don't improve your heterosis or your hybrid vigor. This is a test or a study done to show that and prove that. So the progeny of the genotypes with large genetic distances show significant heterosis effect. So if you've got a like a land race and a land race mixed together, you're going to get a very little effect. But if you mix uh, one that's a land race and something that's been mixed a thousand times, so it's very hetero heterozygotic, that's when you're going to get, uh, there's a higher chance of getting your hybrid vigor effect. That's what that's explaining. Hanging, being through. Plant density. That was, well, I didn't sum it up by saying down the bottom here. Um, the yields from plant density. So if you want to go and put one plant per square meter, this was this test was done. Uh, one plant per square. Then they go and put two plants per square meter, and then they show the different techniques from doing it. So this should really be discussed. Um, in this isn't to do with breeding. This is really to do with yield and plant. Anyway, I'm here now. Um, so there's four different techniques. They left a control. They defoliated one. They lollipopped one, which means take the bottom half off the plant, and they just pruned in the other one. So down here on the results, you'll see from the control, it got, with one plant, it got 220 grams per watts per meter. So for this square meter, it got 200 grams. Defoliation, this one, 180. This one, 229. This one, 255. So the only one that improved from the control was pruning. Keeping in mind, this is definitely cultivar specific because ruderalis don't like to be touched or handled much. So this isn't a gospel. This is just a good study that's been done. And then they went and put two plants of the same type in the room and in the, another room and see what happens. Well, their yield was 321 grams from two plants. So one plant got 222, and two of them only got 50% more, so 321. And then they defoliated, 320. Their lollipop, 295, and their pruned was 232. So nothing went better to control by bunching them in together. So the plants, they spoke to each other. They did spoke, I don't want, you know, this place is mine. You know, allelopathy was in effect when the two plants were in there. So that's just an example of that. That should have not been in today's. 
fast breeding tools to match the fast brace of the climate change. This is um, to do more so with labs, just how they're accelerating things through CRISPR, Cas9, and making it happen effectively fast. Uh, breeding approaches for phosphorus use efficiency. So when you're going to breed, you want to consider the nutrient uptake of the plants. So if you can get ones that utilize their nutrients better, that's going to be a successful outcome. So if you've got a progeny that is a phosphorus pig, you might wanna go and keep back breeding with the parents a lot to try and eliminate that. So you would eliminate with not the one that has the phosphorus problem, with the other one of the parent that doesn't. So you'd be putting that back with that other parent and back crossing, and then you would put test progeny, test them, and then you test them, see which one wasn't phosphorus deficient when you were giving a phosphorus less, like a phosphorus less amount in your feeds if you were, when you were doing a controlled experiment. So you do it in a controlled way where you'd, you'd um, limit the amount of phosphorus going into the plants and see which one was better at utilising it. So that's this just goes into fancy detail about telling you which genes. GMPT7 is responsible as a transporter encoder gene. And yep, that's enough said on that one. Uh, this, the use of marker assisted back cross breeding. So uh, this is saying that a minimum of five or six back crosses are generally, are usually required. Yeah. But if you use marker assisted, you can get across quicker. The recovery of the recurrent genotype can be accelerated with the use of molecular markers. Well, it's any marker assisted breeding. That's, I've sort of already covered this. If the F1 is heterozygotic for the marker locus, individuals with the recurrent parent allele at the marker locus in the first or subsequent back cross generations will also carry a chromosome target tag tagged. Mm -hmm. On pyramiding, I didn't really explain that. Gene pyramiding has been proposed and applied to, to enhance resistance and disease in insects by selecting for two or more than two genes at a time. For example, in rice, such pyramids have been developed against bacterial blight and bacterial blast. The advance of using markers in this case allows selecting for the QTLs for the allele markers is they can find them easy. <laughs> Conclusion, marker-assisted selection is the most widely used application of marker systems in breeding. Without the use of markers, breeding would decide for its individuals to cross based on their phenotype. However, phenotypes are influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. Because remember, the genotype equals the environment plus the, no, the phenotype equals the environment plus the genotype. And future challenges for marker acid selection would be improved, cost efficient, better in many different ways by doing it. I'm not going to read all that. What's this say? This is the pyramiding. Oh, yeah. See if I can zoom in here a bit. The pyramiding multiple resistant genes in a single cultivar. So this is how you draw it up and make sure that this happened. So you draw that up and think this is what I'd like to happen. And then you go and do, perform the task and do the crosses and see what the outcomes were. That's today. I think it's done. It's done, is it? It's all done. It's a start. Wacky do, wacky do. That was massive. Any other comments? They're both toxic. Yeah. Uh, it's been a good hour and a half. Hour and a half. Thank you, Dave. Dave 969. That's why Lars says that's what I'm trying to do. Good. Seems like the obvious first choice because you don't have the chosen chose markers. Yeah. Mark assisted breeding is everything. It's just brilliant. And then when you know what you're looking for, or when you target that breeding program to pull those genes across, it's so fun and so rewarding at the end when you get the result. Like this early finishing gene, I keep going on about it 
it's just fantastic to transfer that across. It's such a win, mate. It's some people they always used to say, "Oh, eight week cultivar, whatever," you know, and then you'd grow them, they'd finish after ten weeks. This is legit. I don't know what eight seven fifty six. Wow, it's a seven week seven seven forty nine. It's a seven week flowering cultivar with that. If it's the dominant, the dominant ELF gene is being exposed. Wow, and from so far from tests, it looks like it's uh, it's very successful. Anyway, I, yeah, it's just very successful. Can't go about that. Uh, says he's making an ultra fast flowering triploid. Oh yeah, so that's the. You read my mind. Uh, that's <laughs> that's pretty much what I've done. <laughs> that's the go. The triploids for everybody. They're uh, about ninety five percent infertile, so you can't really breed. It's the offspring is ninety five percent infertile. Uh, I've been working with my lavender bomb for a couple of years now, and it was triploid. You can tell by. Uh, there's, if you get your compound microscope out, they're stomata, oh, what's it called? It's the index per square inch of stomata. There's a word for it. And then you look at that under the microscope because each stoma is larger in triploids and tetraploids and they have a higher stomata density index. That's the word. So there'll be more stomata in diploids, which is your normal stuff, but for us playing with the triploids and tetraploids, they have their bigger stoma. They're actually bigger in size, each individual one. And the index, they're not as many per square inch or per square 2.5 centimetres. It's to mild density. Yeah. Um, so there's some easy ways that you can tell. And also there's a way, if you get a microtom and you do a, the microtom's a little tool that holds stems and you put a slice into it, put that under the compound microscope, you can see that the cells are actually a lot larger in the hypercotyls on the, between the ground and the your cotyledon leaves, that's the hypercotyl, and that's always fatter in your um, tip triploids and tetraploids. So that's another way you can tell too without doing any lab results, lab tests. Uh, that's cool. Good on you, Lars. And some of you should see the size of the seeds, mate, for the uh, tetraploid seeds. They're massive. It's, yeah, it's to do with breeding. I can talk about that today. Uh, you read my mind. We all stomata density. Seedlings are pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, how do you tell? Why are they obvious? I can only tell from a thickened type of coddle. That's the only way I can really tell. Interesting. Shouldn't really have Lars up for a talk. He said, Lars says, my plan is to keep doubling until I have fist-sized trichomes. <laughs> cool, as I love. See, working with mutant genetics is such a plus. And in Australia, there's so many mutant genetics because one of the ways to install a gene mutation is through x-rays. So a lot of things that come in, they get x-rayed. So that's a way to initiate a gene mutation. So that's why there's so much Australian bastard weed around and you can work with them. Like Lars making his mutants and trying to breed with them. There's another cool breeder called Frank too. He's, uh, he works with his duck foot. Uh, he does his weird breeds like that to get different outcomes. It's a way to show different gene expression in ways that's not normally done through mutant genetics. It's cool as. Well, says hypercotyl and the cotton lens are thicker. So this is his way of telling that they're easy to tell inside in his seedlings. So he says that the hypercotyl, which is the area below the cotyledon leaves and to the where the soil is or to your substrate, that's thicker. And cotyledons, he was saying, are thicker too. Oh, in width-wise, compared to the tissue, compared to a tissue cult cultured nodal culture, they're way more obvious. Okay. So the cotyledons are thicker as well, he's noticed. That's cool. It's very cool, this tetraploid and triploid stuff. There's a, oh, that book. Oh, what's the book on ploidy? It's so excellent. 
I'm up to page 115. I can't even remember the title. Oh, oh well. Tissue culture plants, says Lars, have maybe wider leaves. Hard to tell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, tissue culture. Yes. Very good. Yes, tissue culture is a good, fun way of doing it. And everybody can do tissue culture at home too. I'm going to explain, I think, uh, next week is to talk about roots and stuff from the roots, I think. And then the week after that's tissue culture. So I'll explain on how you can all do it at home very easily in your own little lab. You get to get a tote, turn it upside down, cut two holes into it for your arms, and then sterilise it. It's all about sterility because bacteria and fungal cells grow 10 times faster than plant cells. Plant cells develop every, what, 15 hours, and bacteria can develop every minutes. Remember, E. coli can cover the surface of the earth in 48 hours, given the right conditions. So it's all about sterility and keeping things clean, really. So that's what tissue culture is about, so you can all play around. And if you fail, you just get fungus growing on it, and it's a, you just try again. That's pretty good fun. There's only five things you need to for a plant cell's requirements. So if you match all those five things, the plant cell will divide, and that's what you're doing. Same with what you're doing with um, cloning, how you've done that. You're producing roots, so you're tissue culturing roots by using too much oxen. So that's just an example. Anyway, I think I've been talking for way long enough. Uh, where was the HY5 gene? Did I cover that? There's a rad slide that shows about the HY5 gene. Uh, so I just, I don't remember going through the HY5 gene. Trust me then, the HY5 gene is to do with the elongation of the hypercoidal. And DWF gene is the opposite. Oh, that's a shame. I don't blimmin' at it. Sorry about that. A bit of bro science nearly instead of grow science. I like to prove what I say. So it can be, um, yeah. Oh well. Well, next week, make sure. I if there's any questions, put them up now because I was just going to go through and make sure everything's been covered today. Leaf curl disease. Yes, I went through everything. Atypic scoring. Yes, it's done. Uh, I can show you what I'm doing next week. What? Next week will be roots. The effects of Kenna roots. Uh, how oh, THC breathalyzers. Oh, phyto research. So phyto remediation. There's different types of that type of remediation that can be done. There's like the phyto. Uh, what are they? Phyto stabilization. Phyto transformation. Uh, phyto volatilization when you change it into make it volatile. So there's plenty of different ways where you can. It's more cleaning it up though, but still. Oh, well, that's what I thought would be good for next week. And then the week after is plant tissue culture. Woohoo! <laughs> so I hope everybody's enjoyed today. I surely have. It's been a very long show, probably my longest one. It gets me excited. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate everybody staying in there. Oh, Lars isn't um, – I'll just go over the screen, help some Lars out, make him a – anyone else – Contributing a lot, add as moderator. There you go, Lars. Standard moderator, mate. Anyone else who contributes lots isn't a moderator? Yeah, I'll just scroll up the little thing. Walking lightly isn't. Hooter isn't. Poops isn't. All right, I'll put all of them. Poops, because Poops is cool. Standard moderator. He does a lot of experiments too. Walking lightly is a very good commercial, legal commercial grower. I know who does into his goodness as well. There you go, fellas. Very good. 
Yes. I'm still live, I ain't gonna make sure. Yep. Yeah, so please tell everybody, tell your friends, trying to spread the word, trying to get rid of this bro science. I was speaking to another um, educated person on LinkedIn this morning about how science is changing too much. Even the scientists are starting to put out shit. So we need more people out there to spread good education, quality education, so the word gets out, so we can clarify with slides, not with mouths. So it can be easily misinterpreted, or I didn't sleep good last night, so I'm saying the wrong gene name, or things like that. Um, so you really need, I don't know, I just, we just need good education, mate, and then the, the powers that be will understand on how important this plant is and how it can be more regulated for us. So if you can spread the word about this show that I do every Saturday, that would be very greatly appreciated. Uh, because I've been let down by the Australian community of late. Let's just say that without going into it. It's a lot of rotten eggs. <laughs> too, anyway, I'm not getting into drama because it's all about good knowledge, mate. We have too much good fun we can do with plants. Look, today was just on breeding only and testing, progeny. So it's, there's so much fun that can be done only by yourself. And we've all got our own weird niches. We're all weird people. We don't like uh, mingling too much. So it's stuff that we can do successfully and happily in our own, you know, locations. It's it's cool as. So I hope to engage with more people and help more people and get more questions coming through the chat, so that um, I can help more. Because out of the only money, like I just don't make anything. I just appreciate being helping people and get spreading out the good word. Education. <laughs> oh, there's a few nice words come through. Thanks, mate. And Kelly, where's that? Thanks, Lars. Thanks, up there. No worries, fellas. Stony Creek, were you a moderator? Yeah, you were. Very good. Lars says, there will come a day when human knowledge doubles every day. It's exponential. Yeah, not with AI, artificial intelligence, those bots now, mate, unfortunately. But I did believe you. <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah, just trying to get the word out, mate, is very hard these days to get the honest Grow science with GRO, not bro science with B. It's even on LinkedIn, there's been some papers like the one that was put out by um, uh, uh, the Canadian company that they were saying that their scientists were saying they hang buds, their plants upside down to increase THC amounts in the, in the tips of their buds. Things like that. Like stuff's being really misled the wrong way and there's going to be people believing too much rot like the people in Australia that have spread bad rumours about me and too many people are believing it. So it's just um, we need to pull stuff up so good education can prevail about this plant. Ooh, I think I crapped on about it enough, eh? <laughs> Thanks. Artificial intelligence will be responsible for it a lot. Humans can't do much, yes. But we can still play with science. We can still play with our plants. Yeah, that's the go. That's where I come in. Good plant science. Soil science and microbiology related to, related to medical cannabis. That's what this stream's all about, and myself. Good organic growing, only using chemicals to remove deficiencies through foliar applications and maintaining sustainability. So it can be the soil and microbes, etc., can be left better when you started. That's a good way to conclude, I think. So I hope that everybody can spread the word about this show and thanks for everybody for listening and see you all in 166 well, hours now. It's not 168, it's a week. <laughs> Excellent. And I hope you all have a fantastic day and night. Happy breeding, happy growing and good health to you all. Bye-bye.